So what are the sources of uh, the fMRI signal? Uh, fMRI, in short, uh, reflects a complex signals. Um, fMRI measures uh, blood oxygenation level dependent signals, and uh, this source of the blood signals is very complicated, and uh, it's uh, one of the uh, active areas of the neuroscience research. And so, uh, like EEG, um, any theory of consciousness needs to be compatible with the new findings, uh, especially when it you know, uh, interprets the neuroimaging data in terms of their theory. This is a, a very uh, you know, nice kind of uh, short uh, summary of what this MRI signal is. So when there is a brain activation, then uh, brain is, uh, uh, has a lot of blood vessel, right? So let's say if this, there's a neuron like here, and then uh, there's an uh, dendrite and so on, and then you have many of them, many thousands of tens of, uh, uh, them, then there there is usually very small uh, blood vessel nearby them, and then for the uh, mechanism that I actually don't know, uh, when the neuron fires a lot locally, then uh, this neuron will consume a lot of uh, uh, oxygen nearby them, and then that is somehow sensed by some kind of mechanism, and then. Uh, that is uh, provided by the regulation of the blood, uh, um, you know, amount, and that's the uh, that happens right after that. So that's the inflow of the oxygenated blood, and so basically the, the sequence of the event is that you know you use you know uh, you know neural resource, and then that uses O2 uh, uh, oxygenation, and then that is somehow compensated by the lots of uh, fresh uh, blood. To that local area, and the bold signal is measuring basically the difference between this uh, red uh, kind of thing that is uh, oxygen, you know, rich um, um, blood versus a hemoglobin versus uh, oxygen poor uh, hemoglobin. So that's the uh, you know source of the bold signal. Okay. And uh, to understand what the bold signal means, so basically this is highly related to blood. And uh, relation to neural activity is not straightforward, right? And um, the, uh, one of the most interesting paper is this uh, uh, paper that was uh, studied by the local Nikos Logosetis, which um, whose work you will be hearing over the next couple of weeks. So what he did, was to implant the electrode, like uh, uh, EEG study that I uh, mentioned in, in the last in the lecture, and then uh, measure the fMRI bold signal change at the same time as uh, local field potential and also spikes. When you see this multi-unit activity or spike density function, SDF, blue or green, that's roughly the same as spikes, uh, may, average spikes of the many neurons. Um, you don't need to worry too much about it. Okay. And then what he did is uh, in a unit of a second, he presented a stimulus from ten, uh, 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 the time 10 in this figure. Okay, what happens is that uh, following. So initially, you know, at the onset of the stimulus, all of these you know, measures of the neuronal activity, LFP or multi-unit or single uh, spike density function increases a lot. Uh, the LFP goes even actually like this, and that's why you don't see you know, it there. And here it's a signal change in terms of a standard deviation unit. So it's really huge response for um, LFP. And then uh, multi-unit and uh, signal, uh, spike density function also you know, it goes up really hugely and then goes down quickly. Here, this is already kind of, you know, um, Disappointing, but you know, bold signal doesn't do anything. Okay, so when you show the stimulus initially, it doesn't respond, but after five seconds or so, it starts to catch up and then it starts to increase. And then by the time the bold signal is increasing, LFP goes down. And interestingly, 
uh, spiking on average goes to this, you know, flat and almost like baseline level. It's it's one of the most interesting thing about this, but uh, even when you present some kind of, you know, stationary uh, and also uh, quite an interesting stimulus all the time, as long as it's sta stable, many of the neurons starts to increase its firing initially and then goes to the baseline. Only subset of them sustain firing, but your phenomenology conscious experience remain. So in that sense, I don't know what to say about this initial transient response of the LFP, but afterwards, you know, LFP is kind of, you know, um, reflecting at this stage uh, in this uh, special cases, most, you know, correct, uh, you know, correlated with the phenomenology. And fMRI initially not, you know, phenomenology of the stimulus present is coming right after the stimulus onset. So this, this is definitely too slow. And, you know, average spiking is also not really tracking the phenomenology because it goes to the baseline. And then when you present the stimulus, uh, when you turn off the stimulus at this, you know, 34 seconds, then it goes uh, below baseline for uh, all of this uh, neural major LFP, multi-unit and a single spike. And then ball signal remains high uh, for roughly like five seconds and then goes down. And it goes down even, you know, lower down baseline. It's called uh, undershoot mechanism. Okay. So, in sum, uh, this just you know brief explanation of this you know uh, fMRI, uh, LFP, and spike uh, mechanism uh, simultaneously recorded by Lobosis and colleagues. Uh, shows that the temporary speaking, LFP seems to be correlated well with our phenomenology of the seeing the visual stimuli in that particular case, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, about onset and offset response, it's quite enigmatic at the at stage. And fMRI-wise, uh, it lags uh, five seconds of the local neural activity, but overall, mold uh, is really well correlated with LFP, but uh, less with uh, spikes. And um, one of the uh, key message of that Lotus paper was actually that LFP and spikes may carry different kind of aspects of the local computation. LFP reflects more of the input into the area and the spikes are uh, more reflecting on the output from that areas. Using some kind of pharmacological technique, they showed that, but that's less relevant for the consciousness research at the moment, so I, I'll skip. And, uh, but the important thing again is that the fMRI allows us to obtain phenomenological reports from the humans with a high spatial resolution. And this is in particular powerful when you're uh, studying the uh, kind of experience and its correlates, uh, which doesn't change over the time uh, really quickly. Okay.